Okay, let's consider problem, a famous problem that can be found online easily. Who made it? But a miner is trapped in by a cave. Okay. But then in the cave there are three tunnels. back into the cave. So if we go here, we end up here, go here, we end up here. And one of the tunnels leads to the exit. And there are some assumptions here. The miner is uh, does not know which exit, which of the caves lead to the exit. And the miner can't remember which tunnel that he took. So if he took the wrong one, it comes back to its original place. Uh, he doesn't remember, and so the probability of choosing the right tunnel is always one third. And if, if he chooses the right tunnel, then it takes three hours to get out. If he chooses a wrong tunnel, then it might take seven hours to get out. And the final tunnel will take five hours. Uh, seven hours to get back, five hours to get back. Okay. And the miner in no way can mark which tunnel he took. It's, uh, it's too dark for that. And he doesn't get tired, and so it always takes seven hours. So the question is, if t is the time it takes time for the miner to escape, what is the expectation? How much time do we expect the miner to spend inside the cave? Uh, the best case scenario is that he gets out in three hours, and the worst case would be he gets stuck in here forever by choosing one of the other two tunnels, right? But can we even find the expectation? Is it even finite? Is it less than infinity? For this problem, we are going to we are going to use the law of iterative expectations. We're going to say that the expected time that the miner spends inside the tunnels is going to be one third. Okay, so we're conditioning it on the on which tunnel he takes, right? So one third is the probability that probability of choosing the right tunnel. He chooses the right tunnel, the only time he spends in the tunnel is three hours. Right? So far is everyone okay? And if he chooses the second wrong tunnel, that takes five hours, first of all, it's going to take five hours to come back to the original place. And then, once he comes back, we expect him to take exactly expectation of t like this much more time to get out of the tunnel if we assume that expectation of t is finite okay similarly we're going to have a one third chance of choosing the seven hour tunnel okay everything makes sense so far so now it's just an algebra problem now it's just 1 plus 5 over 3 plus 7 over 3 plus 2 thirds expectation of t. So we get uh, 12 plus 3 is 15 divided by 3 is 5. So 5 plus 2 thirds expectation t is expectation 
And so move this over here, so one third. So multiply by three, and we get 15 hours. So it turns out that he doesn't spend too long, or we expect that he doesn't take too long in the second house, even though um, he might end up in an infinite loop. On average, it would take about 15 hours for this to be complete. Okay, so now we're going to generalize the log iterated expectations. Okay, let's assume that we have two information sets. So information sets is often talked about in game theory because we have a certain amount of information. Okay, let's say we have omega one, omega two. And let's say that, for example, omega one is a is smaller than omega two in the sense that it's a subset of omega two. For example, omega two could be what the consultant knows. And omega one is just the consumer. So we assume that the consultant knows everything that the consumer knows and maybe might know more. Okay, then I'm not going to prove it, but I'm going to state that the expectation of Y given our information. So here, what we're saying is maybe we're a consumer, we know this much, and then based on our information, we expect y to be something, okay? That's what expectation of y given omega one means. This is going to be equal to expectation of the expectation of y given omega two given This is the most generalized form of the law of iterated expectations. Uh, one way to picture this is to think of omega one and omega two as a camera lens. Maybe we can imagine that this is HD, high, high definition. It's like 360p. So if I use a bad camera and I take a picture. That's the same thing as taking a picture with a very good camera, and then I have that picture. But then I take the picture of a picture using a bad camera. So I end up with the same picture. Okay, this is an easy way to memorize what, it, what this is saying. And actually it works the other way, even though the other one is not law of iterated expectations. So expectation of y given omega one is the same as expectation of expectation of y given omega one given omega two. So again, the picture analogy works, but this, we don't even need the law of iterated expectations. So again, this one is a picture using a bad camera. This is a picture using a bad camera and then using a good high definition camera to take that picture, but then it's still a bad picture because the original photo was bad. But for this one, we don't even need the law of iterated expectations because uh, remember if we have an expectation of a function of x, given x, then because x is given, because x is given, h of x is deterministic. We know what it is. And so we don't need to put, we don't need to have an expectation operator. In other words, it can come out of the expectation. This is just h of x because x was given. Uh, similarly, here, oh, okay, and furthermore, 
If I have even more information than just x, if I also have information on z, still I can take out h of x, right? Because what, whether I have information on z or not doesn't matter in this case. I have the information on x and therefore I can take this out. Here, omega 1 is a subset of omega 2 and therefore this term inside is deterministic. And so we're going to take it out of the expectation. This is not using the law of reiterated expectations. This is just using a property of conditional expectation. Okay, so don't confuse these two, even though the picture analogy works both ways. Here, we can't do that in the law of iterated expectations. We can't do that because this omega 1 might not have enough information to know what omega 2 has. But still, right, and so we can't take it out. Instead, it's going to be expectation of y given omega 1. So let's give one more example. Uh, so what is the expectation of the expectation of y given x z? Given? Using the generalized law of expectations, we have an information set. We have an information set two and an information set one. The information set two would be the bigger one, would be the information set having both x and z. And the information set one will be just x, right? So based on the law, this will be expectation of y given the, the bad camera, right? Okay, so now we're going to prove this. Proof is going to be long, so make a new page. Okay, so the expectation of the expectation of y given x z. Remember when we're doing proofs, it's usually better to start on the more complicated side and then simplify our way down into the more simple side. So we're going to start on the left hand side. Okay, using the same logic as before. When we prove the first case of the law of iterated expectations, um, we have a function based on x, and so we could do the first step, right? I'm going to do the same thing here. This is, in the end, a function of x. And so I can write it as No, actually, this is a function of uh, x and z, right? So it's going to be a double integral of the square y equals y given x and z, y of z given x and z. Okay, what happened was that What happened was that uh, I just applied the definition of, of conditional expectation onto, and then I turned it into integrals. But here, note that we have a conditional PDF right here because we are given x. This is the most outside, right? We are given x, and then we need to find z. And I'm ignoring the subscripts, but then maybe I could write f of y given x and z, but then I'm assuming that this is understood. Okay, and now I'm going to write out the definition of the conditional PDF going to be f of y x z divided 
by f of x z dy and then f of x z divided by f of x z. So this turns into that. Okay, and now note that uh, similar to what we did before, this green part is not dependent on y, and so we can bring it into the integral. And when we do, the numerator and denominator will cancel, and we'll end up with a double integral of f of y, x, z, divided by f of x, dy, dz. Okay, and now I will take, oh, well, actually, well, let's do this first. I want to get rid of the variable z. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the order of integration. And I'm going to use the fact that if I integrate it with respect to z, then I'll get the marginal probability. So I'll have the integral of okay, so I want I want to do this. F of y x z dz over f of x y dy. Okay, so what happened was that because this outside integral that used to be outside. It's not dependent on y. It could go, uh, we could get y outside of the integral. Uh, we first change the order, and then we bring the inter we bring the y outside of the integral, and then we bring one over f of x outside of the integral, and then our integral outside ended up here. Because it's not dependent on y, and it's not dependent on x. Remember that f of xy, was first defined as a joint probability. And then I said that actually it could be a marginal if we consider the context. Well, this is the context where it could be seen as marginal. The top part, this part, if we add everything with respect to z, then the z will disappear and we'll end up with f of x and y only. So note that here, f of x, y is not joint, it's marginal. Because marginal and joint are relative concepts. And so if I apply the definition of conditional PDF, then I'll get y, f of y given x, dy. But this is the definition of conditional expectation by definition. And so we're done. Are there any questions?
find it, so I'll just do it off of memory. So remember that uh, two events are independent. What does it mean for two events to be independent? It's the probability of A intersection B. No, no, that has to be A. Probability of A times probability of B. Was, no, it wasn't, right? Probability of A intersection B. And if we know that two events are independent, this is the definition, then we know that probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A, right? Because probability of A given B is the probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B. But now we're going to consider the independence of two random variables, where x and y are random variables. And we say that the two are independent if the joint PDF could be split into the two PDFs being multiplied together. Note that it's, it looks very similar to what we have on top, except on the bottom it's a PDF, instead of just one probabilistic event. Note that if x, y, and z are mutually independent, then we would write f of x, y, z can be split into f x, f y, f z, where they only take one variable each. And if x, y, and z are mutually independent, then automatically we know that x and y are independent, and y and z are independent. And furthermore, mutual independence is different from pairwise independence. So suppose we have n random variables, and then we choose two of them. There are n choose two ways to do that. But every time we do that, the two are independent. That's what we call pairwise independence. And note that mutual independence implies pairwise independence, but not the other way around. I think the simplest example of an instance where it's pairwise independent, but not mutually independent was had to do something with birthdays. I don't remember the specific example right now, but you can look it up if you're interested. But uh, it's important to distinguish between mutual independence and pairwise independence of random variables. And if x and y are independent random variables, then the covariance is going to be zero. Furthermore, this also implies that the correlation, which was covariance divided by the variances, right? But covariance is zero, so correlation is also zero. And so this is what I mean when I say, when I said that before, let me try and find it. Okay, so here I did not use the word independent because we didn't learn it yet. But correlation being zero does not imply that they're unrelated. Here they are, we can't say that they're independent. They're actually, they look very dependent on each other. If x gets decided, if I know what the value of x is, then I have only two places for y, right? And if I know that x is here, then y becomes deterministic. And so I cannot say that in this case, x and y are independent. I can only say that they are not correlated, which means they don't have a linear relationship. So maybe we can understand it as they're independent, 
there is no relationship, and the covariance and the correlation is zero if there is no linear relationship. Okay, so make sure you distinguish the two. Okay, and now we are ready to learn what IID means. This is an abbreviation that comes up often in probability theory and statistics. And so IID means independent identically distributed. And IID refers to a set of random variables. Going back to the basketball example, maybe we, if xi, all follow the binomial distribution. So maybe x1 can be the number of points I make in day one, and so on, or day n. Then, assuming that I don't get better in practice, then this probability is not going to change. Maybe I shouldn't have used the word n here because it's binomial of np. So, day n. Uh, so, my probability doesn't change, and furthermore, every day I get to shoot, shoot the same number of baskets. Then, every day, I'm following the same distribution. That's the identically distributed part. If every day I shoot and then my probability changes, or I shoot a different number of baskets, then they're not identically distributed. So identically distributed should be intuitive. Independent means that my information on how many baskets I made on day one or whatever day doesn't affect how I do on other days. So maybe, for example, uh, Maybe we have a whole team, and there are n people in a team, and we're going to count the total number of points shot by the team. Then if, a if one member starts doing poorly, the other gets pressured to do well. So maybe they're related in that way. But, and so in real life, independence and identically Independent, identically distribution, distributed variables might be hard to find, but anyway, in probability, we assume it to simplify things. So assume there is no relation. Okay, so these are independent, identically distributed variables, and now that we know what that is, we can define what a random sample is. So in probability, uh, in statistics, if n, is fair, if n is the number of people in Asia, and n is too big for us to do anything with it, you know, we can't, uh, we don't even know n because n is changing, but anyway, let's assume that n is fixed. And we want to know how tall is, on average, how tall is a person from Asia? Then we can't measure everybody from Asia because Asia is so big and some people are hiding and we don't know where they are. But for now, we're going to assume everybody is the same, but still, and it's so large that there's no way for us to do everything. What we do is, out of all the n people, large n people, we're going to pick a small n, a subset of the n, right, and then measure them. But, so maybe we can do something that's simple enough. Maybe n is 100. Oh, in economic journals, you might see 
uh, they might discuss a, the education level and they say an education level of schools and they'll say n is 1,220 or something. This means that they took a sample of 1,220 schools and they're assuming that this is a representative sample. Or maybe they don't, they, but then the paper will tell us what the assumptions are. But we want it to be a representative sample. If we choose 100 people from Asia, we don't want to choose everybody from one country, like Sri Lanka, right? It won't be a representative, a good representative of Asia. So what's the best way to do it? There are lots of theories on this, but theoretically, one of the best ways would be to get a random sample. So what is a random sample? It is to say that if x1 and xn are the heights of people. So right now, we are measuring the heights of 100 people. So I'll have 100 different random variables. Why are they called random variables? Because we don't know what the height of the people are going to be until we choose the person. Until we measure that person, we don't know what X1 is. X1 could be me, it could be someone else from Asia, it could be anyone, right? So it's a random variable. But anyway, these random variables are called a random sample. This is a proper noun. It's a random sample if they are mutually independent and okay, so they are a random sample of X, a large X. follow uh, if they're mutually independent and each xi each xi has the same marginal probability density function as the original as x so if the distributions are the same and they're mutually independent then we say that xi are IID, independent, identically distributed. And so, if I have a joint probability density function of x1 all the way to x100, then by independence, I can split them. All the way to x100, right? But because they're identically distributed, they're the same as fx1 being multiplied 100 times, right? Alternatively, I could write f of x1 all the way to xn is the product This large pi that I wrote, I don't think I used this before, did I? I don't think I did. It's similar to the summation, except in summation, we add everything inside, but in the product, we multiply everything inside. So that's what's happening here. We're multiplying everything inside. So the first step is achieved through independence. The second step is achieved through identically distributed. Uh, through the fact that they are identically distributed. Are there any questions on? Assuming that, of course, 
this is where things get kind of confusing. We're going to assume that the random sample size n goes to infinity. So we're going to consider what happens as n gets larger and larger. And obviously, does this ever happen? No, it never happens. I can't think of an instance when this happens. But um, usually, what is the specific number? I don't know. It depends on the research, it depends on their funding, and it depends on their research question as well. So in our example, we don't know if this is like one time or two times or something. Well, actually, in our example, um, yeah. Definition of random sample? Well, the definition of random sample doesn't specify and n can be anything. But in practice, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But later on, we're going to consider, or actually, I don't think we can do it in our session. But when we consider confidence intervals, so if I want to be 90% confident, we can write uh, alpha is 0.1 because this is 10%. If confidence is 1 minus alpha, then if I want a confidence interval of at least 90%, then I can find a specific number n where it needs to be greater than something. This is also done assuming that um, n is infinite or anything, but yeah. based on the confidence interval that we want, we can do this. I think in the sciences, the p-value or how confident we want is uh, could be like 1%. We want to be like 99% sure or even 95% sure, but I think in the social sciences, 10%, 5% is also used. Okay, so, so before we studied some discrete random variables, right? We studied binomial, we studied negative binomial, we also studied geometric and Bernoulli, but they were specific instances of the binomial and negative binomial. But now we can also consider, or we should consider some continuous random variables. So let's start with the most important one. The one that you'll most often come you will most often see is called the normal distribution. And everyone's seen, the, seen this before. It's like a bell shape, it's symmetric, and there are two parameters. There is mu and sigma squared, which is how spread apart it is. So if x follows the normal distribution of mu sigma squared, so the two parameters for binomial and negative binomial were n and p, right? Now it's just the average and the variance. These are the two parameters. Because the normal always takes on the same shape, or not the same shape, I shouldn't have said that, but it can be scaled into the same shape. So maybe a normal could look like this, maybe it could look like that. More, um, so this will be high variance, this will be low variance. If my mu, if my mean shifts, then the whole curve shifts this way. But it can be scaled into the same shape. That's what's good about the normal distribution. That's one of the good things about the and the PDF of normal, I think this comes up so often that uh, anyone who wants to, uh, anyone 
this number right here. 
this is the probability that my x is between 0 and 0 0.5. And let's say that x is a normal variable, but maybe x is an exam score. So maybe, yeah, it shouldn't be an exam score. Uh, it should be something that's going to be negative infinite and infinite. But for simplicity, let's say it's an exam score, and the mean is 70, and the variance is eight. Then note that I only have a table for a normal variable, normal, a standard normal, which means I only have a table for the normal of zero and one. So what I do is maybe instead of finding the probability that x is between 60 and 65, instead of doing this, I can normalize this. Remember, it was, the normalizing factor was, I do x minus the mean, divide by the, vari uh, the square root of the variance, and I do the same thing for here. Then these numbers, I can find them in the table. In fact, they'll be on the negative side because the average is 70. And I want the probability of being between 60 and 65. I can get this value, right? I can get it by noting that the normal variable is symmetric. Actually, I didn't say that, but it is symmetric. And so I can use the values between 75 and 80. And Wikipedia gave me a table, and there are lots of different tables, but the table that Wikipedia gave me was I can find this area by searching the table, and then I can find this area by looking at the table again, and then the difference will be the area that I want, which was the area that I started. Right? So using these two values, I can find my answer by normalizing. That's why we only need one table. This is the only table that we need. And actually, what's better than a table is a program. So if you download R for free, it's free so far. And we go to downloads.
default is the lower tail equal true. What this means is that in the Wikipedia table, it gave us the area between zero and the z value. And this is enough to find any, any uh, probability. But sometimes we get a lower table like that. So if I plug in a z value, a positive z value, then it tells me what the area from negative infinity to that value is. So that's what's happening in R, lower tail equal true. And this one we'll ignore for now. This has to do with the log normal variable. So if I do 0.9, mean is zero, standard deviation is one, then I'll get uh, 0.81. So this is the probability probability that our value is from is below 0.9. Right? And so what, what I did here, these three values, they tell me the probability. I'll do this and then we'll continue R later after the break. But I'll show you what I did just now. So I typed in the code P norm of 0 0.901. What this means is that this random variable follows normal zero one. And I typed in point 0.9. What R gave me was the area of the lower tail and said that the area of the lower tail, which is the probability from negative infinity to point 0.9 was equal to the first value here, 0.81593999. This is what P norm point 0.9 and notice that if I go to three, then three, if this is zero, this is 0.9, this is two, this is three, three is way up here. If I do this area, this whole area, it's going to be almost everything. In fact, R tells me the exact probability is going to be 0.998, so very close to one. 